from God, I'm okay with it. If it's not from God, I'm okay with it. If it's something that God wants to do to usher in the return of Christ, I am definitely okay with that. But if it's just a, a natural phenomenon, let me encourage you with this verse out of Isaiah 42, or excuse me, 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song and He has my salvation. So, so far we've looked in these seven letters. We've, we've looked at uh, the city of Ephesus found in chapter 2, verses 1 following. Ephesus was a lot like uh, Los Angeles. Great wealth, Tremendous influence, great wickedness, sinfulness, and paganism. The church in Ephesus was lawful. They had not compromised the word of God. They would not compromise the gospel. They would do what God said. And so they were very obedient to God. But they were also guilty of being loveless. Of being so... Uh, obsessed with the rules and regulations that they had lost their heart, their first love, Jesus said. Their love for people, their love for one another. And so they were commanded and, and commended uh, to repent. Then we moved on, last week we looked at the city of Smyrna. And Smyrna, I equate, is a lot like San Francisco, a protected harbor. Uh, it was Smyrna was called the crown of Asia, fully devoted to Caesar, uh, Rome, a large, very large anti-Christian Jewish population in the city of Smyrna in 95 AD. The church was suffering, but successful. There is no condemnation in that letter. It's only commendation and words of encouragement. And you find the really the reason for the revelation, the, the point of the book of Revelation was to reveal to the suffering people who belong to God that God is still God and He is still in control even though there is great suffering and persecution and hardship. And so the admonition is found to the letter in Smyrna. The, the, really the thesis, if you will, the purpose of why Christ revealed himself to John and wrote this book is found in chapter 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto death. That's the purpose of all these words that are written. Some that we can understand and some we can't, right? So today we turn our thoughts to the letter in the church in Pergamum. If I was to equate this ancient Greek city to a modern one, I would have to say it's, it's a lot like Sacramento. It was the seat of the Roman imperial power. It was the uh, seat of government in that area. Um, ironically, it was, it was no longer on the coast. The postal route, the route, the next church on the route goes inland from the coast. Um, it held tremendous administrative importance. Uh, it's where laws were instituted and enforced. Many of the long-term citizens of the state of California, we've witnessed a lot of radical changes in legislation in the last several decades, haven't we? I mean, think about it. It wasn't really all that long ago we had a conservative as a, as a governor. Um, but, man, have things changed since then. We've been shocked. We've been really appalled at the kind of legislation coming out of Sacramento that has led our people, our schools, our businesses, and our culture further and further away from the will of God as revealed in Scripture. And so this probably is why Jesus addresses this church the way He does. And let's read that together starting in verse, chapter 2 and verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Verse 14. 
but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality thus you have also those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one else knows except him who receives it. So Jesus is addressing a government uh, city, and he is describing himself as holding a two-edged sword. A sword in Scripture and a sword in the Roman Empire in that day was a symbol of governmental authority. He says it's a two-edged sword. One edge probably discerning truth. The other edge is punishing evil. And so Jesus says, I am the one who has actual authority. He's tapping into this city's persona and he's reminding the church that he is superior to any and all of those who are in Rome and to those who are behind the Caesar, the ruler of this world, as John would say. Pergamon was proud to have some of the oldest temples in the region devoted to the worship of the emperor. This may explain why Jesus states that the city is where Satan's throne is. It also had a significant temple at the top of their hill called the Throne of Zeus. In essence, Satan is working through this city uh, through his paganism to persecute and to seduce disciples. And that's how Satan works. He, uh, he has two approaches for those who are children of God. Persecute or seduce. That's his two ways of getting in, trying to ruin us in our relationship with the Lord. So Jesus starts off like he does with all of his letters with a commendation. He says in verse 13, you hold fast my name. So despite the opposition, despite the pressure, the church is tenaciously staying true to the Lord. Holding fast is the opposite of letting go, amen? So it means that they were not quitting. They have what I call pit bull faith. Once they bite, they're not going to let go. It says, you did not deny my name. It did not deny your faith in me, maybe your translation says. And although they're tempted greatly at this time, they had a a specific period of time that was a very intense they didn't capitulate the pressure was evidently probably the, the strongest when uh, uh, Antipas was martyred we really don't know anything about this person uh, he was only mentioned in Revelation 2:13. Um, there is no extra biblical historical record of this martyr the only time we ever see his name mentioned is when we what we just read so what do we know just from what we read. We know that Antipas refused to recant, he refused to retract, and he refused to forsake. His allegiance to the Lamb eventually cost him his life. He was, as Jesus said earlier in verse 10, he was faithful unto death. And that's the reason why Jesus highlighted this particular brother because he had just said, be faithful unto death, which is going to be repeated throughout the book. And right after that, he mentions a person that everybody in that area knew was faithful unto death. And we all know this, don't we, family, that the moment that uh, Antipas' spirit left his body, he was where? He was in the paradise of God. We know that for sure. But... Jesus goes from something complimentary to something condemning. He mentions Balaam. Maybe you've never heard of Balaam before today, so let me give you a little bit of background. In the book of Numbers, there was a prophet by the name of Balaam. He was a prophet for hire. He was a, a preacher for prophet, if you will. And the Moabite king, Balak, sees this, all these Jews wandering into his area and he's frightened that they're going to conquer his kingdom and so he wants to 
uh, destroy the Israelites, but he knows he can't go up against them in a military way because he just witnessed them uh, abolish the Amalekites. And so the God of the Israelites is protecting them and, and empowering them. And he is a wise king and he knows, I can't destroy them by going to war. So he asked Balaam, to, to curse Israel, and he says, well, I can't do that. And so, but eventually, Balaam's greed caused him to suggest to the Moabite king, have your women fornicate with the men of Israel. Have them marry the men of Israel. And before long, they will be worshiping idols, eating meat sacrificed to idols, participating in that worship. And also, uh, of course, by doing so, they would lose the blessing and the protection that God had given them. And if you read in Numbers 25, you'll find out it actually worked. It worked. And so the teaching of Balaam is... Um, Therefore, God's uh, reminding of the church to be careful to compromise with the world standards, to be careful to participate in what the world says is okay and the Word of God says not. And guess what area uh, he, he tightly focuses in on in the area of sin? He's talking about sexual sin. And then he goes right into mentioning another sect within this church called the Nicolaitans, which we visited earlier in the letter of Ephesus. Again, this cult was one that was encouraging disciples to incorporate beliefs and morals and values and eventually practices that in fact were declared by God to be sin. And uh, their deed would bring about their spiritual death. So what's this mean? Well, it doesn't take us long to realize, does it, in today's world, our world here in California in the year 2020, there are the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Yes, within Christendom. Let me give you a couple examples. The largest denomination on in the world is renowned for its alcohol consumption. In fact, one of the newest facilities that was built nearby here, if you go to that church's uh, property, you will see along the side of the building, youth center, activity center, bar. A growing number of denominations in the world and in, in, in uh, the United States is now allowing lesbians to be their pastors. An alarming number of mega churches in their quest to fill their gigantic buildings and to finance their huge budgets are allowing their members to cohabitate without the benefit of sacred marriage. And they're also tolerant of divorce and letting people within their churches divorce for whatever reason. And so we see this Nicolaitan and Balaamism in our situations today. And so Jesus in verse 16 is warning the church there to you know to correct their way, to repent, to turn away from what they were involved with. He he warns them to correct course. If the members are going to refuse to allow him to be Lord in every capacity, then they're following not Jesus, but the God of this world. And and if they don't repent, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to war against them. It's a very sobering thing. Jesus says to the church in Pergamum, if these people that I'm talking about, and you know who I'm talking about, he says, if those people don't repent, I myself will come and war against them. How it must grieve the Savior to have to punish the people within his own church because they won't repent of their sin. And he says, I'm going to bring the sword of my mouth. Hmm. Well, like they did, we too today have a right to fear the sword of Caesar. Police carrying out the will of lawmakers and rulers. 
the headlines are containing a lot of scary news of citizens being arrested because they are not complying with the COVID-19 mandates in their area. Personally, I think it's just tremendously ironic that governors are using drones made in China to bark from the sky to force people to comply to mandates in response to a virus that was made where? In China. But as frightening as that is, that the government can do things like that and does do things like that and could possibly do things even worse in the future, despite all that, let me share with you what is more frightening than that. And that is the sovereign Son of God wielding a sword of His own to remove immorality from His church. This is one reason why people don't read the book of Revelation. They like the warm, fuzzy Jesus. They like the shepherd who walks forever to hoist that lamb on his shoulders. They love that forgiving, loving, empathetic, compassionate Jesus. But they don't like the other side of the coin. And let us not forget that Jesus Christ is also God. And God must be holy and God must be just and God must. He must, out of His holiness and justice, he must punish sin. Yes. It's very sobering, isn't it? When he's talking about, I'm going to take care of my own people that won't repent. But he finishes on a note of courageousness in verse 17. To the one who conquers. Here's the compensation for those who are the conqueror. The, the reward for the victor, if you will. Manna from heaven. The, the hidden manna. Food from heaven. What's that represent? Miraculous provision. What's that symbolize? The loving presence of God. We, we don't need meat sacrificed to idols. We don't need to be involved in demonic worship. All we need is to trust God and He will provide. I know that God is providing. You know how I know that God's providing right now? One of the biggest complaints I hear about people during this mandate is that they're getting fat. <laughs> is that the problem? Well, God is generous. But you know what's more important than physical food is the invisible food, the immaterial, the spiritual, the eternal that comes from the Father. Very interesting that he mentions that um, he's going to give those who conquer, those who are victorious, he's going to give them a white stone. In, in this day and time when it was written, the white stone represented uh, innocence. If you were in a court of law and the judgment was made that you were innocent, they would give the person a white stone. That was a proclamation that they were acquitted and not to be punished. It was also a symbol of admittance. If you were invited to a banquet, you were given a white stone. If you did not have that white stone, you were not admitted into that banquet. It was also a symbol of retirement. If you were an athlete or a gladiator who played in the games, uh, you were given a white stone, and that white stone meant that you were now allowed to retire. So what does that mean for us today? What is a white stone? It's all the above, isn't it? And that Jesus said, there, there is no condemnation for you because you are in me. Romans 8.1 That you will be admitted into the great banquet that I'm preparing for you. That you get to what? Retire. Yeah. From this world, from its travail, from its frustration, from its sickness and death, sorrow, grief, stress, and you get to retire from this and be with Him forever. And then he finishes up with one of the sweetest things I've ever seen in all the Bible. I'm going to give you a new name. Watch this. It's a new name because you're a new creature. It's because your character now looks like mine. And guess what? Here's the sweet part. Listen to this, family. It's, a, it's not public property. This name is secret. It's secret between you and Jesus. Don't you love that? 
I love little secrets, don't you? I love when, like when a couple have special names for each other and they don't let anybody else hear them and they lean over and they whisper to them and the other one gets all giddy and laughs and giggles and they hug and kiss. I've got one for Becca, but I'm not going to say it publicly on YouTube. But let me tell you, it's cute. It's really cute. And none of you know what it is. Not one of you. Because it's between us. It's between us. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new name if you overcome, if you don't give in, if you don't compromise, if you stay true and you die faithful to me, I'm going to give you a new name and it'll be a name just between the two of us. I love that. It's so promising. Sounds kind of like a Kind of like a mother, a little bit, doesn't it? Did your mother give you a little nickname when you were tiny? Did your mom call you something sweet? Does your mother still call you that, even though you're 50 and have your own kids and grandkids? But she still calls you that name, that nickname. How much closer can you be to someone when that happens? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. I'm going to give you a white stone and there's going to be a name on there that no one else but you and I are going to know. That's how intimate, that's how close he wants to be. Listen to the word of the church, of the Lord, church. Beloved, we are God's children and what we will be has not yet appeared. But know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. I hope you're encouraged today. Joe's going to come up and lead a psalm before our communion, and so let's get ready to do that. His grace reaches me. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father and it's mine my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole his grace reaches me yes his grace reaches me and will last through Now I'm under His control And I'm happy in my soul Just to know that His grace reaches me Higher than the mountain and brighter than the sun it was all third at calvary for everyone greatest of treasures and it's mine to has washed them away. His grace reaches me. Yes, His grace reaches me. And will last through eternity. 
Now I'm under his control And I'm happy in my soul Just to know that his grace reaches me Good morning, family. So uh, great to be up here and looking down upon you. Um, for those of you who do not have the, uh, the, the emblems, we have some up here if you need them for a uh, celebration of the supper. Um, when Jesus gathered with his disciples, he got the bread and he broke it and he said do this in remembrance of me and that's what we're here for right at the moment that's what we're doing we're remembering Christ and the sacrifice he made for us so that one day if we listen to the Bible and, and adhere to it we can be with him forever let's pray for the emblems dear Lord we're so grateful that you would Put yourself upon the cross that you would suffer a painful death so that one day we can be with you lord we're so grateful we pray for this in jesus holy name Yeah, at that gathering where Jesus was with the disciples, he also got the fruit of the vine. And he passed it amongst his disciples. He says, drink this in remembrance of me. That blood that he was to share the next day washes away our sins, makes us holy, makes us pure. That's the only way we can get to heaven is to be like Christ. Having said that, our God is a graceful God. He forgives us for all our sins. Let's pray for the uh, fruit of the vine. Dear Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for the blood that he shed for us so that we can be with you. Lord, we're so grateful and that he would suffer this painful death for us. We pray for this in Jesus' holy name.
That concludes our celebration and our commemoration of the Lord's Supper. For those of you who are able, up the front we have our mailbox that, that uh, you are able to put some contribution in there if uh, you're able. We, we're so grateful the church um, is still functioning and we still have to uh, pay the bills so to speak. So anything you can do is, would be so grateful. Uh, any visitors, we don't, you don't have to do that, but uh, um, we won't stop you, but please, you don't have to. Thank you and have a great uh, day. Have a great Mother's Day, Mother. I want to uh, especially thank Brian for his hard work on our technology this morning. He pulled it off. Amen. And I'm... I can just tell by Brian's countenance, he's really thrilled that I had just done that. <laughs> well, I would say I'm going to let you out early to go to the restaurant, but I guess I'm going to let you out early so you can go through the drive-thru. Good luck with that, folks. Hey, uh, it, we're going to continue to meet at 10 o'clock. I am hugely impressed that we didn't have a stream of cars coming in at 1045. You guys did great, so we appreciate you and love you. And uh, any other? Okay, so we got word that Linda Tucker is at home. And uh, we're also uh, celebrating how God's working to protect all of us in our congregation and our families. And uh, so we will see you guys next Sunday, 10 o'clock, 101.3. God bless you.